Welcome back everyone. In the last video I talked about how Calvin first came to Geneva, came to power and influence in Geneva, and then uh, was driven out of the city and went to Strasbourg for a while where he continued to learn more about political leadership and integrating political leadership with religious leadership. Now Calvin's departure had thrown the city of Geneva into disarray. There were some of the citizens who wanted to return to Catholicism. There were some of the citizens who were in favor of Calvin's ideas, but not Calvin's leadership. There were some of the citizens who were in favor of both Calvin's ideas and Calvin's leadership. And adding to the disarray is a letter from a famous humanist named Jacopo Sadaletto. And what Sadaletto argued, and Sadaletto was also a cardinal in the Catholic Church, and Sadaletto argued uh, that the Genevans should return uh, to the Catholic Church. He said, you sort of tried this Protestant thing, it hasn't worked out, you're fighting with one another, um, now is an opportunity to return uh, to the Catholic Church. And he made arguments, theological arguments, for why the city of Geneva and the citizens should return to loyalty to the Pope and to the local bishop. And uh, the city council couldn't find anyone to return uh, to respond to Sadaletto's arguments. And so in the end, they turned to Calvin. Calvin made a response, and his response to Sadaletto won him new respect and influence in the city. And he became the pastor of a large church, and he continued to preach and uh, and reform and there's a, and this is the church that you see uh, depicted here where Calvin preached uh, there's a cool story about how the first day that he returned the first Sunday that he returned to the church uh, after having been driven out several years ago he went up to the pulpit to preach and he preached from the exact same verse where he had left off uh, when he went into exile and so uh, this is kind of a sign of Calvin's strength of will and his determination not to compromise with the teachings that he believed uh, were true. And it signaled that he was coming back to Geneva in a position of authority. Now, despite uh, the invitation from the city, it's not as though Calvin had a lot of resources at his disposal. It's not as though it's like the Catholic Church where you have this big hierarchy and people are responding um, you can say, hey, now I'm going to have all the monks and priests say this, and they say it, and you convey uh, your ideas in, in that way. And we tend not to think about these kinds of questions today because uh, we have access to the internet, but it was a real uh, challenge uh, at, at the time uh, how you spread a unified uh, message. And so Calvin is going to establish a legal structure of the church that is going to enable him to implement his teaching. And so the structure of the church had several tiers. Uh, doctors, whose role was to teach the faith and interpret scripture. Pastors, who were to preach and administer the sacraments. Um, candidates who wanted to become pastors were examined by the doctors. Deacons, to carry out social work. And 12 elders, to maintain uh, discipline and godly living in the city. So they were chosen for, for their wisdom. And their elders is kind of the most interesting part here. Um, they're the part that kind of falls outside of sort of a mirror hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Well, for doctors, you have bishops, for pastors, you have priests, and deacons, and deacons. The elders are a little bit different. The elders are chosen as uh, pious leaders in the community, and their tasks were to examine people's lives, uh, to examine if people were living godly lives, and to report those who were not living godly lives uh, to the consistory. And so you could be ranked. Uh, pious, lukewarm, or corrupt. And those who were corrupt were reported to the consistory, which was the court of the city of Geneva. And so it's a church court, but now it's become a state court as well. So we saw this with the radical Protestants uh, in the last material that we studied. We see this now with Calvin, that you end up with a theocratic society. And there are several reasons for this. The first is that uh, if, um, if you do away with the Catholic idea that you can go to confession to a priest, do a penance, and be reintegrated back into society, uh, if you do away with that sacrament in the way the Protestants had, then uh, your actions had very little implications and influence on your salvation. What we're going to see with Calvin and some of these other reformers is that the people, for them, 
people are saved and their works have no uh, no influence on whether they're saved or not. People are saved by their faith. How do you know that people are saved? You know that they're saved uh, by their actions. So their actions are not what's making them saved. Their actions are reflecting whether or not they're saved. And so this is um, kind of a key part of Calvin's theology, but it means from a social perspective, if you've already decided that someone's not saved, you have no or very few obligations to care for these people. Um, instead, you may as well drive them out of your community. This is what the Anabaptists had done, and Calvin is going to do this as well. And so the consistory is a court that's composed of elders and pastors, and its role is to supervise the morals of the people of Geneva. And it had the power to excommunicate uh, the citizens who did wrong. And excommunication in a theocracy means not just excommunication from the church, but excommunication from your home city and your home community where you had grown up. And some of the sins that were punished with excommunication included the ones listed here, adultery, cursing, disrespect to church leaders, any sort of traditional Catholic practices like um, using icons as an aid to prayer, praying in Latin, lighting candles, things like that. Social crimes were also uh, studied, examined, convicted by the consistory. That included music and dancing, um, any kind of uh, alcoholic uh, consumption. Uh, and so this is very much a theocratic society where not only religious behavior, but also social behavior is being regulated. Now, the consistory was not only supposed to keep order, it was also supposed to be a source of education uh, in the city and to demonstrate that Calvin and the other leaders of Geneva were concerned for the salvation of the souls of those in their care. And uh, so the consistory is a source of education, but it's also a source of authority. As Calvin is establishing his authority in Geneva, he does not shrink from using the consistory to establish himself. Uh, in 1546, Pierre Amot, who was a member of the little council, so someone who held executive power within the city of Geneva, criticized uh, Calvin. And he was concerned that all the ministers, all the pastors, the elders, the doctors in this new infrastructure in Geneva, that they were French. He kind of looked around and said, well, these people are outsiders. They're not natives from the city of Geneva. They're not our people. They're Protestant refugees who are coming from France, who Calvin knows, and Calvin's kind of having basically a French takeover of this city. Uh, now, Amo also ran a card playing business, is not a good thing, not a good business to be in when the Calvinists are taking over your city. And he was going through a long and messy divorce, which was being administered by the consistory. Uh, and uh, so he comes to resent Calvin and criticizes Calvin for um, teaching false doctrine. Calvin persuades the little council that this is not a personal attack, but an attack on his authority as a minister. So the little council still holds political power in the city of Geneva, but they have become highly influenced by Calvin and Calvin's church, who increasingly hold some kind of government powers and who have the sympathy of the people. And so the little council convicts M.O. and forced him to complete an act of public penance. He has to walk through the town dressed as a beggar. He has to beg for mercy in three public squares in the city. This is a very clear sign to the people of Geneva about what happens if you go head to head with Calvin. And uh, when uh, there was some outcry in some quarters of the city that this man who had been a prominent leader was being forced to behave in this way, Calvin arranged for a place of execution, a gibbet to be set up in a Moe's home neighborhood. Uh, and that's a very open threat. Agree with this, go along with this, or there's uh, going to be political suppression and political violence. And so this uh, means that this public opposition uh, kind of dissipates. Other wealthy families also challenged Calvin. They had invited him back, but they were not happy with the fact that the consistory had become so powerful that it was judging their, uh, their, pu their public lives and even their private lives, uh, and uh, they wanted to reduce Calvin's power. Uh, 
Uh, however, they are not successful. And Calvin did not lack courage. Uh, when there was a mob uh, that was threatening the council, he charged into the mob and basically said, take me first if you're going to shed any blood, otherwise stop intimidating the council. And people were impressed by, uh, by his courage. People were impressed by his courage. People were impressed and convinced by his preaching. And this means that Calvin, in the end, is able to uh, convince the council to imprison these wealthy families who we refer to as the libertines. Uh, some of them were even executed and this is all part of Calvin consolidating his power within the city. Nevertheless, the most important source of encouragement and support for Calvin came from outside the city. Between 1560 and 1562, approximately 7,000 religious refugees from France, so that's People in France who had accepted Protestant theology but were persecuted in France because France remained a Catholic kingdom ruled by a Catholic king. These refugees, 7,000 of them, came and settled in Geneva. Now, before Calvin arrived in the city of Geneva, the population was around 10,000. And so this is totally changing the social fabric of Geneva, this huge uh, influx of refugees. And why are they coming to Geneva? They're coming to Geneva because Calvin's there. They've read his commentaries on the Bible. They've read his institutes. He is the leader that they want. Most of them, if they're able to emigrate uh, from France and come to Switzerland, they're relatively wealthy and they have a relatively high status. They're able to influence this society and they provide Calvin with unquestioning support. And so this means that the population of the city tilts dramatically in favor of Calvin between his first effort to lead the city and his second successful effort. For these Calvinists, uh, they saw Geneva as the city of God, the city of the godly on earth. Uh, that was why uh, they were coming to the city. It means that by as early as 1555, Calvin has uh, essentially unchallenged uh, authority in Geneva. Uh, we're going to stop there for the moment and we're going to talk about Calvinist theology in the next video.